Well, hey, welcome back. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, come back up to the stage again. We're going to round out today's topic with what we're calling the wheel of cyber. cyber. So this is uh, based off of the NIST standard overall, which it's always great to have a standard when you're trying to figure out what to do within a situation. We've really you know, gravitated towards that NIST standard and um, this is our own gray matter like wheel here, but it goes with risk assessment within the identify stage. You've got defensive capabilities within the protect stage, detect this is advanced threat detection. Respond to those detections with our strategic response and disaster recovery within the recovery stage. And so what I want to do is just throw this out round robin to you guys. Um, if we could spin the wheel, I would spin it and you would pick your category, but we can't. So we'll work on that for next time. Maybe like a giant uh, wheel of fortune kind of uh, thing that you could spin. But John, I'll throw it to you first. Pick a topic and looking at it from the perspective of heavy manufacturer, mm -hmm. you know, and how either you've dealt with this in your own, you know, career or just how you think about it in general, but pick one of these categories and then let's just talk about that and then Scott, you get the next one so you can be okay. thinking about what yours is thank here. You. So, yep. John. Sure, thank you. Um, so we'll start at 12 o'clock, just um, identify or risk assessment um, from the, many, really from any environment, not just manufacturing, I think it's critical that you understand what you have there, right? So having an inventory of all your assets. Uh, there's a saying in cybersecurity, you can't protect it if you don't know what it is or where it is. So um, identifying that equipment, uh, where it's located, what it's connected to, who has access to it is critical. Then do your risk assessment against that asset. So you understand uh, where the vulnerabilities are, what protections are around it, and um, then you're able to move on to some of the other phases here. Great. Before I go to Scott, I just want to give one more plug also to the chat. So this is your chance. Last opportunity, throw some questions into the chat. We'll respond to those live here right now. And uh, as we get those, we'll push forward. But Scott, go ahead. Sure. And I first want to apologize for being the ugliest Vanny, Vanna White there is. But oh, come I, on, I want we had. No, no. Uh, <laughs> so I'll start off with, uh, since, he, he, since you took a diff, I'm going to take detect, right? So when you think of detection, and the reason why I brought this up is uh, really you think of uh, assessments and it's that point in time conversation we had earlier, right? I, I see what my risk is at this second. I know what my risk is at this second. The minute I leave that facility, my risk has changed, right? Someone changes a firewall policy, someone changes a rule, something I'm not aware of happens. So when I look at detect, what I look at detect is really being actively monitoring the behavior and risks of my network, whether it be what comes in and out, what my, what my behaviors of, of specific users on my network are doing and how my assets are behaving. So what this is, is looking at risk from a continuous standpoint, understanding what it is and understanding how, as it evolves and seeing it on the spot in the second that it happens. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is it's kind of a, a counter to what you do with identify, right? When I look at an assessment, I understand my threats, I understand my risks, I prioritize them, I start addressing them. When I look at detect, it's more of understanding as those risks evolve, how they may impact my day-to-day -day operations and what things I can do to get ahead of potential risk. So that mitigation strategy. So when you start looking at things like advanced threat detection, we start talking about deception technology, where I set at the perimeter and I understand what's coming and going from my network, understanding how a malicious actor might be behaving on my network, as well as taking it the next step and let's build context filtering and making sure the right kind of traffic is coming in and out of my environment and so that I can make sure that my systems are operating the way they're supposed to be and they're being used regardless of a, a trusted zone or an untrusted zone, what's coming and going is meets my appropriate risk level. So we'll, awesome. we have a question yet? Uh, we do actually. So this one comes in from Adam and Adam says, is it irony that for decades people with fictional widgets used to describe manufacturing process, but now we use a script for widgets to report on manufacturing process. Little, little irony there, that, I appreciate there, Adam. Here's this question though, how do you handle network with, there's issue of power outages? So that's a potential vulnerability when everything's starting back up, you hit it while it's down. How do you handle power outages? So I'll go first and then I'll let John follow up. But the first thing is, this comes about a disaster recovery, business continuation. It's something when you put your plan together, it's a risk, whether it be a cyber impact or a non-cyber event, it's the same impact, right? How do I keep my business up and going in case of an event? 
So a couple things, right? You can look at, do I have the right power backups? Do I have the right up systems? Do I have the right kind of continuation there? The other part is, do I have the ability to do some of this off-site? So I have some ability to do it not on-prem, so I don't have to rely on the power there. So when you start putting those things together, you start kind of creating and weaving kind of a redundancy situation. And that's the other part. When we look at power outages, it's not always facility-wide. It could be an individual device. So do I have the right redundancies in place? Do I have a right plan? If this device fails, what happens? Where's my failover? So those are all the kind of things I start considering when I look at power outages the same way I would look at any other cyber event. I don't yeah, exactly, Scott. I think it's it's part of your basic disaster recovery and business continuity plan, right? You have to make sure that um, if the device needs power, there's going to be power available or backup power there. It's part of the availability um, uh, context we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. So another question coming in from our chat. Uh, this one comes from Steve. Mm -hmm. Steve asks, how do you structure OT cyber teams? I think John you were getting to this a little bit earlier, but maybe dive into that a little bit more, sure. just looking at overall the, and this kind of falls into the strategic response and the respond mm -hmm. category absolutely. overall. So right. why don't you hit that for us? Yep, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, in my career over 20 years in security, 15 or 18 years in, in manufacturing, um, it's been key to kind of integrate or converge those ITOT folks because different worlds, right? I talked about it before. You don't want to hammer down IT controls into the OT world. Um, and, and so um, making sure that you have those teams engaged and talking to each other. I've been at companies where we've had um, IT steering or uh, cybersecurity steering committees, and, and they included somebody from the OT world. Uh, because when you're making a, a, a policy change, you want to make sure they have a voice at the table, right? We talked about USBs. I'm going to lock down USBs. They can raise their hand and go, oh, wait a minute, that's going to be a problem, right? And so um, getting, getting the right uh, structure to the team, um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier we're, we're bringing in, uh, we're hiring folks into the plants who are reporting to the cybersecurity team, but they're OT folks. So they'll fit into the plant. They know how to work with the plant, um, but they'll help the plant understand what our policies and procedures are and help enable them and, and, and um, you know, work um, securely. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree. And I think one of the things we kind of want to look for is generalists who do everything. Mm. And that becomes more and more of a challenge, specifically when you start getting into the OT world, right? I already become a specialist mm -hmm. if I'm just OT. But then once I'm in OT, I still have to be kind of an expert on a little bit of everything, right? I have to be a network guy. I have to be a vulnerability response guy. I've got to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, counterintelligence. I've got to be, you know, incident response. I've got, to, I've got to be the infrastructure guy. So when we start seeing all these different hats we're wearing, a couple things I've learned when you build a team is one is making sure that available resources are diagnosed and, uh, and known, right? So if I'm not a network guy, do I know where the network guys reside? Can I pull them in as needed? If I'm not a vulnerability management person, are they getting the vulnerabilities out of OT into the system that's managing vulnerabilities, right? That's one of the things we often don't consider is that you already in the enterprise typically have a vulnerability response team, someone who's responsible for maintaining and managing the vulnerabilities. The problem they have is usually they don't get the data from the OT side. It usually stops at that fictional wall between the two and it doesn't ever become actionable to the guys actually looking at glass, right? The guys looking at the monitors. So making sure that they can do it and making sure that they're viewing the data and, and creating an actionable integration with the, on, the boots on the ground is, is very important when you start to build a team. Mm. Yep. Well, I think we've covered the majority of these. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about Deception Guard. I just want to throw this out to you guys just as a, uh, a, a crazy use case. So the other day we were talking about standing up a new factory with all brand new automation for the first time. And I actually was suggesting that we may stand up Deception Guard even before there's any automation in the plant because that way we'll begin to be able to see what's happening if there's bad guys that are trying to get into our plant. We'll know it before there's anything there. If there's anything going on, we'll know right away. So just real quick yeah, riff off of that. So absolutely. So I think the value of deception in OT, right? I think that's something that's it's a different paradigm than we see in IT, right? In IT, a lot of times deception is used as counterintelligence, finding out how the bad actors, luring them in and getting that behavior so that I can then build better policy. Well, in an OT environment, I'm not trying to lure them in. And because I'm deeper down in the stack, the assumption is if they're already communicating with my deceptive devices, they're in my network already. I'm already exposed. What I'm now doing is diverting the potential attackers. 
right? I'm taking them away from the threats they're going after. And as they're sniffing out, so for in the new factory situation, as they're sniffing out and they think, oh great, I found me a bunch of unpatched PLCs. Let me go see what I can do to these things. And while they're communicating, that first instant they start communicating, what I've now done is they, they first they're talking to a fake device. So there's no damage they can do. Second, the minute they start interacting, I can now throw up a flag, say, hey, someone's in my network, someone's doing something they're not supposed to be doing. How do you want me to react to this? And when you look at the tool like Deception Guard, where this becomes really powerful, is I can actually create my automated response. I don't have to have a guy step in and say, hey, let's close this port. Let's change this policy. Deception Guard will actually say, because I'm a fake asset, so I know it's not a false positive, I now can initiate my response. I can say, this actor can no longer be in my network. I'm going to block them out. Or this actor can only communicate through these ports. This actor can only do these things. So I start limiting his footprint automatically. So I give myself time to get ahead of an attack. Right? So when an incident starts to happen, because I have a zero chance of false positive, right? I need that interaction so it's not a false positive, then I can trust my reaction, to, my automated reaction, to actually be legitimate. It's not going to create different drama for me and allows me to be very proactive. So if I look at a, a new asset, I'm, now, I'm actually now kind of creating this this perimeter, this virtual perimeter, this fence that allows me to kind of protect it. On top of that, beyond just the deception capabilities, I'm also filtering the traffic as it comes in. It actually contains content filtering. So I can make sure that the person coming in is coming from the right location, he's using the right IP address, he's coming from the right country, or he's coming from the right network, right? All these different contexts I can look at and say, should this guy, does he meet these contexts? Should I let him in my network? Yes. So now what I've done is I've taken a lot of the workload off the firewall. I've also made sure that there's been some scrubbing of the data before it gets in, so the white noise has been minimized before it starts getting into my OT network. So now at this point, I'm t I kind of look at it like the 80-20 rule, right? I've eliminated 80% of the threat vector, so now I can focus on the 20. So if I've got a small team, how much more valuable that is versus everything? I have to worry about everything. Now I'm only worried about the 20, and I can put a program in place that focuses on that 20%, that last mile. And it becomes much more easier from an OT with a limited resource to leverage a technology like this. That's great, Scott. <laughs> we got another question from Jason online. He says, there's oftentimes difficulty in getting buy-in for OT cybersecurity. What do you suggest in terms of getting people to buy in and understand the need for, for OT cyber? I'll throw this one to you, John. I'd say just have management watch the news. <laughs> I mean, in the past six months, there's been enough happening to, you know, the pipeline, the meatpacking, uh, you, you name it, it's, um, it's out there. So I, I know 20 years ago, it was hard for me to go in and convince folks about OT security. In fact, I got thrown out of a couple plant meetings just because they didn't, they didn't think it was real. And, and now it's just, it's prevalent and it's in the news every day. So um, I, I think if they want to understand, um, you know, highlight those things, mm -hmm. you know, put those in your presentations to management, uh, show them that it's happening out there and we don't want it to happen to us. So I think that's yeah. the way to approach it. I think the other thing that I've had lots of discussion <laughs> about is that OT, cybersecurity, is actually a downtime mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. So the worst thing that could ever happen in a plant is downtime. You don't make money if you can't make the product. An OT cyber attack is almost guaranteed downtime. So. You know, that idea of just being down at the plant is scary enough, and then you add the kicker of a ransomware on top of it that could be a 10x type yeah. of a penalty for that. It kind of gets people's attention overall without being too gloom and doom, but the reality is it's, it's tough out there. Yeah. So. yeah, no, absolutely. If you look at it, uh, Department of Commerce put out a number, and they say the average manufacturer downtime is $8,000 a minute. That's the cost for a cyber incident to take a, a production line. That's an average. In, in automobile manufacturing, it goes up to $50,000 a minute. Mm. So you think about that, when you start talking about ROI, we always want to think about, okay, how do I return back my investment? But let's really think about it, from, flip that a little bit and think about what's the cost if I do nothing, right? What's the cost of potential, right? When you start looking at the threats, what's the cost if we're down for a minute? Does it justify? If we're down for an hour, does it justify? What happens if I'm colonial and I'm down for four days? Mm. What happens if I'm JBS and I'm down for three days, right? Then all of a sudden, the investment you put in OT becomes much more simpler to, to quantify, but really you put it to your leadership to say, listen, do we really want to get to where we have those numbers, where we, <laughs> we have to be down two days before you understand that justification? And then the second thing is, as Nate was talking about, I'm a firm believer is cyber is unplanned downtime. The same way you do a maintenance program, the same way you invest in predictive maintenance and analytics and everything else you do, cyber is a continuation of that. 
So when you start looking at the investment you're making into it, that's really how you should consider it. The same way I would keep my maintenance program up. It's the yep. same concept. Yep. Well, I think that that's uh, the majority. Of it. I will open it up to our live audience. If there's any questions from the floor, we'd be happy to take those. Um, but otherwise, feel free to reach out to myself or to Scott, and uh, we'd be happy to have a further conversation with you. But I want to just thank everybody so much for joining us today. It's been a great day overall, and uh, we're really excited to uh, continue the conversation. So thanks, everybody.